My name is David Benedict. Until recently, I was the chief London critic for Variety, which, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the showbiz bible. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the journal of record uh, for the entertainment industry. Uh, prior to that, uh, I worked at all sorts of different addresses in the UK and Bloomberg and the Observer and all sorts of places. Uh, as, as a critic prior to that, I was an actor and director. Uh, so I, I have an overview of theatre, which is what we're talking about this morning. Um, hands up how many of you have ever seen When Harry Met Sally? Well, you're all awake, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased you've all seen that. Uh, there's a line in that movie where uh, Carrie Fisher is at dinner with Bruno Gantz, and she's been set up on a date, and it's with um, the other two leads. And uh, she says, uh, I read in a magazine, restaurants uh, are to the 80s what theatre was to people in the 60s. Um, and whilst we uh, don't have the time to discuss the state of restaurants in, in 2015, uh, theatre arguably maybe did start to die in the 80s. Uh, there is a case for saying that the future of theatre is extremely bleak. Uh, we are consistently told that we live in a digital age, and if we live in a digital age, what on earth is live theatre doing, existing still? Um, I'm sure that uh, all of you uh, who may go to the theatre once a year or once a week uh, have a view on whether uh, live art is worthwhile or not, or whether we should be uh, looking to completely change the experience. Um, my distinguished panel uh, also have views and uh, a serious amount of experience in this area. Uh, Variety is famous for what is termed slanguage, which is its own, uh, it, there is a dictionary, when you, when you start working at Variety, you get given this dictionary of slanguage in which um, all sorts of words are used as shorthand. So Disney uh, is always referred to as the mouse house and uh, musicals are called tuners, and agents are called ten percenters. <laughs> and um, uh, we also have a term called hyphenates, uh, which is for people that have multifaceted careers and are not just a director or a designer. Um, they, they cover most things, and my guests uh, today are quite definitely hyphenates. Um, uh, we, on my left, we have uh, Ted Chapin, who runs the Rodgers and Hammerstein organization. Um, uh, he's president. And uh, Ted, when, when, when artists die, their, their works are looked after uh, by <coughs> people who run the estates. In almost all cases, the people that end up running the estates is somebody's widow or somebody's uh, cousin or somebody's son uh, who tends to know very little about the creation of the actual work, and the work is policed, uh, nothing shall change, and if it was done like this in 1942, it must be done like this in 2015, um, which bears very little relation uh, to what is really going on, particularly in a world where theatre has changed massively with every decade. Uh, the outstanding exception to the rule is Ted, uh, who completely understands what needs to happen for uh, the catalogue that he represents, whilst being completely <laughs> true to the nature of Rodgers and Hammerstein, legendary uh, American cultural figures. Um, so I'm going to do each one of you in turn. Ted, um, are you confident about the future of theatre, or do you think uh, we're in a parlous state? <coughs> well, before I answer that, and thank you for inviting me and for being here. The thing I would point out in your, your beautiful introduction is that I am a hired hand, which I think is the key to the estate management of Rogers and Hammerstein. That even though the members of the family had very specific and good roles, having isolated and, and identified the fact that there needed to be somebody who was the fulcrum in the middle of all the discussions, helped me and helped them. Um, it's part of why for 30 years I've had a great deal of fun at that job because it is after all musical theater. Um, the thing that, that, when you started to talk, 
my optimistic point of view is that no matter how advanced the digital age becomes, you still cannot replicate live people together in one same space experiencing the same live event. I say that because the time that I've been at Rogers and Hammerstein, we have seen home video for the movies, which has been a very important part of our business. We've seen the music publishing kind of dwindle down to a strange, nobody quite can figure it out world. Um, what has been consistent and slightly on the increase are the number of productions that we license for people to do in live situations, live actors and live, you know. In, so that from that standpoint, I think their fabulous invalid still has um, a vitality to it as long as there are people willing to gather in one place and witness on a stage live actors doing it at the same time. So that's my optimistic viewpoint. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to, to Richard. Um, conceived and directed uh, Fosse and Ain't Misbehaving, two remarkable Broadway shows. Richard is a director, a lyricist, uh, uh, and a, as I say, a hyphenate, a, a serious all-rounder. So you also see the state of theatre from, from many perspectives for, as, as someone that, that creates shows and, and works in production. Uh, are you optimistic? <coughs> I'm uh, actually extremely optimistic. Um, sure. Um, Broadway's become a kind of a theme park with big shows that run forever and, 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 and all of that. And that kind of uh, blinds you to what's really going on. I think, <coughs> I think we're in the beginning of something that is not going to be visible for a while. And, and the, the, the transformation has happened because 25 years ago there were four schools that, that taught musical theater and taught, and, and taught performance, but also taught writing. Now there are, almost every college has a program, and we are turning out unbelievably talented people. And uh, we're, we're, we're turning out performers by the gross, and, um, and an awful lot of, of, of bright young writers into a, into a marketplace that doesn't have much room for them. And uh, when, you have, when you have talent and no opportunity, the talent finds something else to do. Something's going to happen. There are so many bright young writing teams out there, uh, and they are, uh, they're all uh, pursuing things that you know, we can't even imagine what, what they are. Um, I think that when this lands, um, something extraordinary is going to happen. I mean, Hamilton is one, you know, a, a person who simply followed his own, his own voice and, and, and invented something unbelievably new. But there are, you know, you know more than anything, Jack. There are, there are so many uh, projects out there, many of them are really, really interesting quirky, exotic, um, and, and fresh things. And eventually those things are going to start to make their way into the marketplace. Broadway used to be the place where you invented things. All of the great shows were invented for Broadway. They went out of town and they came to Broadway. Broadway now is the destination. After you've gone here and here and here, it, the cream slowly rises to the top. We hope it's the cream. Um, and eventually, if you're good enough, um, and special enough, you get to Broadway. And so therefore, the, the shows that do arrive at Broadway are, are, are uh, um, especially remarkable. Um, you know, clever, really clever things like uh, um, Matilda, like uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, The Hand of God, all of these really wonderful plays and, and, and musicals. Um, but they, they arrive uh, from a very long trip through a lot of different developmental processes, and then finally they get to Broadway. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I, I think we have no idea what we're going to see in the next 10 years. Great. Um, Jack Vettel holds the uh, singular honor being the only person on this panel, and I'm guessing this room, who's played guitar for the pointer sisters. <laughs> <laughs> did not know that. 
better, sisters. I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they didn't show. What can I say? Um, uh, uh, strangely, he has other qualifications, too, um, uh, and uh, runs um, a musical theatre course at uh, Tisch School and uh, has, like me, uh, been a, a, a poacher turned gamekeeper uh, in that uh, he was formerly a drama critic and writer and is now uh, a practitioner and conceived uh, Smokey Joe's Cafe and, uh, and ushered several of uh, August Wilson's plays to Broadway, six of them. So um, from your perspective, Jack, are you, are you as, um, dare I say, Pollyanna-ish as, uh, as uh, the rest of the panel? Uh, I think you have a panel of, of cockeyed optimists here. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic about the theater in most ways and pessimistic in one way, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll dwell on the pessimistic <clears throat> after doing a little of the optimistic, only because no one else has. Um, but yes, I think from, a, from certainly from a business point of view, Broadway itself is in to wonderful, healthy shape. And I think you're seeing around the country the resident theater movement, which is now over half a century old, um, struggling in some ways, but basically continuing to produce tons and tons of work. There are, as Richard said, many, many interesting writers and directors emerging. Um, and I think the need to, just to echo what Ted said, the need to gather in one place with a group of people and watch a story be told isn't going to be driven out of business by social media or the internet. I, I just don't think, the prediction that radio would drive it out of business, that the movies would drive it out of business, that television would drive it out of business, it's not going out of business. And I think one of the reasons we gather, in addition to being able to hear a story, um, and this can only happen live, which is why I think we're safe, is to watch something that amounts to a kind of athletic contest. You want to watch an actor actually clear the hurdles in a great role without intercutting and without stopping and without retakes. So if you want to see Al Pacino play Shylock or you know, somebody play Roy Cohn and actually watch them get climb the whole mountain in one gulp, the only way you can do that is to do it live. So I feel very good about all of that. What I feel pessimistic about is that beginning really in the, probably in the 70s, but I don't know, I haven't thought it through that clearly, it seems to me that theater became less and less at the center of the national and international cultural conversation. The important works, the things that were on everybody's lips, the, the death of a salesman and the, uh, uh, you know, the Barat Sads, <clears throat> began to slip into other places from, rather than the theater. And they still happen sometimes. Hamilton is certainly one of them. Angels in America was the last one I worked on, but that was in the 90s. Um, I think that that's the one way in which theater is sort of in trouble, is we're, we're, not, we're not at the center of the conversation anymore, or at least not on a regular basis. And of course, there was a time, around the time I started to go to the theater, half a century ago, when we were very much the center of the cultural conversation. That, that has changed for the worse. Do you see there being any return of, of theatre to its cultural primacy? I don't really. In part because uh, theatre's become a, a bit of a, of a niche operation. What produced at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles may be a hot topic there, but not anywhere else. Whereas it used to be this locus of Broadway. But Broadway has become a, a, a essentially a show shop for an international tourist market which is a very, quite a good business. And Broadway you know, has never been a steady business, really. But it's pretty close to a steady business at this point. Um, but that's not where real cultural conversations can happen. Not, not when what's being put in those buildings is being designed to appeal to the broadest number of people who speak uh, uh, you know, uh, any number of languages and are in town for a holiday. That's not where cultural yeah. conversation really comes from. The, uh, um, I'm currently writing the biography of Stephen Sondheim. And, and he and I were talking about this. and he said that when he was growing up, two-thirds of the audience for Broadway were from the tri-state area, and it's now one-third. So if you're, if you're making shows for an audience that is not local, that are traveling in from either across the country or indeed abroad, where English may not be their first language, then you're going to start making shows that are safe, and I use the term advisedly, safe for, for audiences of an incredibly wide 
demographic, and that means that no matter what I think about a show like The Lion King, and there are elements of The Lion King that I think are stupendous, you end up with shows that are going to run for as many years as The Lion King has run, which is about 15, I think. It's just getting started. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, that, that, is, that is going to be the kind of show. It's also a problem in terms of, and Jack has sort of alluded to it, that, that because of the scale of operation, the cost has become insane. Sondheim was also talking about um, when he was uh, starting out and going to the, the theatre in the 50s. He said you would go, you'd go to the theatre or you'd go to the cinema. There, was no, there wasn't that much choice. You had, if you were going to the theatre, you would sit right at the top of the house, but theatre tickets were kind of not that far off from, from uh, movie tickets, and therefore you could develop a taste and develop an interest. Whereas now, you know, ticket prices for Hamilton are insane. I mean, on the one hand, it seems odd to be saying that Broadway and, by extension, theatre is in trouble when a show like Hamilton is carrying uh, an advanced booking uh, level of $25 million. Clearly, there's a lot of people who want to do that. The argument, it seems to me, is about how diverse is that audience? Who is that audience that's paying to see a prestige show like that? It, yes, it's run up $25 million, but maybe that's because tickets are going for $500, and for all I know, considerably more. Um, there was a, a production of uh, a stage version of The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which opened uh, in London. And uh, Bill Dimashki, who uh, used to run the animation arm of DreamWorks, and uh, and also uh, looked after their theatrical enterprises, was really shocked when he went to the opening night because in London, theatre going is a much more diverse activity. The audience is much younger. Um, uh, th there's, a, there's, a, there's not always, but sometimes, a wider racial mix. It's really noticeable to me when I come, when I come and, and see theatre in New York, forgive me for saying so, and I can say it because I too am grey, but how grey the audience is. And it's, it's a very, very different thing uh, in London, and part of that is because of the economics. To put a show on, on Broadway, to put the identical show on in London, it, Broadway is four times the cost. So exactly the same show will cost between three and a half to four times as much. And once you start doing that, producers are going to play safe because their investment has to be so incredibly high. Can I make a point? I, just, I think it's, it's important to say that one of the reasons I think we can be basically optimistic today is about Hamilton because Hamilton is the kind of show that simply wakes everybody in the theater up. It's full of new ideas. For Americans, it's full of part of a history that none of us realize, or very few of us realize. Um, it's done in a way that is very excitingly new. Hard to put your finger on exactly what that is, but that is what it is. And what I love is the fact that, you know, while it was at the public, it had 10,000 words in the New Yorker. You know, the historians are interested in it. it. It's doing what Jack talked about. It's the first show in a long time, probably since Angels in America, yeah. in fact, that actually has and will continue to reach out beyond just the theater world. And when one of those comes along and there's... An, the, the only way it can is to encourage the new, t the new writers, the ideas, the collaborations, work with people who are better than you are so that it can actually be better. Um, there, 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 there are two turntables in Hamilton that are used rather brilliantly. And at opening night, I was talking to the designer, and he said that it, that was his idea because there was, a, there was this scene that had been staged that was very stagnant. And he said, well, what, what, if, what if we put a turntable here? You know, and then he described doing the same dance that was very stagnant, and they put it on their turntable, and he said, this is one of those moments where all the collaborators were like, oh my god, that's, that's the way it works. So anyway, I just say, to be optimistic, two weeks after Hamilton opened on Broadway, doesn't happen every day. But now we can say that today. Um, to play devil's advocate, and uh, I address this to, to Rich and Jack, um, didn't everybody say the same thing about hair? Hair came along and everyone went, oh my God, this is new, this is modern, this is going to change Broadway, rock is here, um, the, the, the old style American songbook shows are over, and, and here is the new dawn, and actually there was no new dawn. 
Do you the, think? The great brown breaking musicals that are going to change the theater never do. West Side Story was going to produce ballet musicals. Ne it's the only one that ever was. Um, um, <laughs> Hair was going to be rock and roll musicals. No one's ever done another one. Rent was going to change the world. No one's ever done that again. It's going to be a good long while before anyone does a hip hop musical that is going to grab people the way. The thing is that, that, that Hamilton is written by someone who totally understands the vocabulary of hip hop and also totally understands the vocabulary of conventional Broadway theater. There aren't a lot of them around. Probably there's one. And, uh, and so he's got a vision and a technique that, that allows a, um, a, a radical voice, a radical writing voice to also serve a totally conventional Broadway expectation or uh, musical theater expectation. Um, so I would say, you know, all, all the big groundbreaking musicals <laughs> that are going to change the world end up being sui generis, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what it what it really is is that 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 a, some writers have come along and t take looked at a story or a subject and and had a unique vision and they followed the vision rather than the rules of the theater. And that's when extraordinary things happen. I mean, there are a lot of other ones that aren't quite as, as uh, you know, world earth shaking as, as, as Hamilton, but Spring Awakening was that, Next to Normal was that. There are a certain number of these shows happening at regular intervals, and they happen because the writers found something. It's hard to get, it's hard to, to, to get those shows on. Those, they take somebody, producer being extremely dogged or writers being extremely dogged and but they they usually prevail if the if the work is good enough and uh, um, <laughs> the hard thing is that in the conventional theater once you announce the show the next thing that you have is your marketing meeting and you discuss the branding of the show nothing's been written yet nothing mm. but you're going to market the show mm. that's the world the, sh the world shift that is that, that has taken place in people's minds yeah, I, w I would I would push back only a little bit against one thing that you said and not uh, and not in a hostile way uh, <laughs> please please <laughs> which is I do think that uh, after hair uh, rock and roll arrived on Broadway it just arrived on Broadway 40 years after hair mm. it took you know Broadway pushed back for as long as it could but actually, when you listen to the scores of Book of Mormon and Little Shop of Horrors was off Broadway, but then moved to Broadway, um, and certainly things like you know that are based on rock and roll, like The Who's Tommy and American Idiot and Spring Awakening, uh, you know what's happened is that that is that the classic American song has the Rodgers and Hammerstein song has sort of is sort of now no longer a part of anybody's life who grew up, who was born after 1960. And so we do have that kind of music on Broadway on a regular basis. It's just that Broadway built as high a wall as it could to keep it out for as long as possible. Um, but the sound of Broadway has actually changed, you know, not because of hair, but because mm. it just, be, but because the sound of our music changed in some way or other. But it is interesting that, as you say, that Broadway kind of resisted it with with all its might and and did it for thirty to forty years. Yeah, and that. And the, but it actually has it has broken through finally because that because in the end Broadway is a business and the ears of the people who are buying the tickets are only used to what they're used to you know and 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 they're not used to what Rodgers and Hammerstein sounds like anymore. So would you say doesn't stop a really good Rodgers and Hammerstein revival from succeeding? I'd like to point out, Thank but you. as new work gets <laughs> written, it gets has written, there been one? It gets written by people you know who were born in the 70s and 80s and. 90s, probably. I'll tell you one, one interesting little quirk about, about, about how things have changed. One of the original orchestra parts from the original production of The King and I, the, I think it's a, the percussion book, the, the, the player wrote down the time that each song started and when it ended in one performance. The overture began, for an 8.30 curtain, the overture began at 8.24 which sort of says they were not necessarily there to listen to have you sit and listen to five minutes. It's to calm you down and shut you up and get you in your seat. Um, and the curtain came down at 11.19. Wow. So yeah, that was a solid three hours, and everybody accepted it. It was 1951, and that was OK. It, you know, that's a particular challenge of doing R&H, because they are complicated. Their stories take a long time to, to you know, and when, when people want to cut 
them, they're very tricky to cut, but audiences that you can kind of get away with 245, 240, if it's a really good production, but it's a dilemma, anyway. Um, I'd like to pick up uh, Jack's point about um, the kind of, what he was alluding to the, the the economic basis of this, you know, we can we can sit here and talk about about works of art and and how how magnificent Hamilton is or how magnificent Angels of America were, but certainly in terms of plays, every American young playwright I know wants to work in London because the climate is so much healthier because there is there is a whole thriving not for profit uh, area where you can work. Um, uh, you will probably know these facts better than I, but, but at some point, when I was going to, to theatre in New York in the 80s, the public theatre was doing something like 12 productions a year, and now it does considerably fewer. Its, its nearest cousin in London, the Royal Court, does something in the region of 15 or 16 productions a year. The, the National Theatre, which gets something in the region of $30 million uh, a year from taxes, um, uh, does 26 productions a year. That gives you the right to fail. That gives you the right to experiment. A show like War Horse would never have happened in the commercial sector. It's a show in which, for those of you that didn't see it, it's got um, huge uh, puppets. It's got, a, it's got a, a long and complicated story about horses in the First World War. It has a set of characters that doesn't speak. Nobody would have gone, I know I'll invest a lot of development money into putting that on the stage. Yes, that's going to be a worldwide hit, certainly. Uh, that was never going to happen. It was developed over two years at the National. It had seven previews. It opened. It was an enormous hit, and it's now generating an amazing amount of income for the National. Um, am I right in saying, if I'm, going to be, if I'm going to be defeatist and devil's advocate, am I right in thinking that shows like Angels, shows like Hamilton, are exceptions that prove the rule that actually... Broadway is now the home of unbelievably safe and um, undaring work. And one of the reasons that it doesn't have a central place in the culture is that it's irrelevant because of that. Um, I would say that those shows that you cite, War Horse, and I would even add The Lion King into that. Uh, the Lion King sort of an exception. I probably should keep it out of this conversation. But um, things like Angels in America and Hamilton didn't come from Broadway. They came to Broadway mm -hmm. only after they proved at some level or other that they were going to be talked about so much uh, that there was a decent chance that even though they were challenging, they would also sell a boatload of tickets. Mm. Um, and so, yes, I, I mean, I think Broadway is by and large about selling a boatload of tickets. Every now and then, a show that is at the center of the cultural conversation that does uh, challenge the audience makes so much noise that it ends up on Broadway. But for every one of those, there are many that are interesting and compelling and start conversations about things that don't come to Broadway because there simply isn't, they're not going to sell a boatload of tickets. And that's, that, that's, that business has become, as you said, because the shows are so expensive, a business of trying to find works that literally millions and millions and millions of people want to go see. Back in the 1940s, if you ran a season and 100 thousand people saw, or maybe 150,000 people saw your production. You had a successful production. Well, 150,000 people is a drop in the bucket at today's, at the cost of today's productions. And as high as ticket prices have gotten, production costs have gotten higher. I mean, if, if, if they had stayed in lockstep, you'd still be able to recoup your investment in under a year. But they haven't stayed in lockstep. As wildly outlandish as the ticket price is, the production cost is 10 times more wildly outlandish. So we can never keep up. Also, I have to say, every time, every time I go to England, I'm jealous of the hundreds of years of experience that you have that we don't have. Um, it, th there's a different mindset about theater. It's a, it's a, from my standpoint, it's a very different part of the culture um, th than it is here. There are, so I'm, I'm, I'm always aware of the fact that, that, that there's just a continuum. Like a show closes and actors go to the next one. Um, the th also, the fact that everything about the culture in the UK is in one large area of the UK. Um, if we have you, have, you have to decide, you're going to be in a, a New York act or you're going to be in LA act. I mean, you can get back and forth, but it's not all, you know, just a, a, a simple car ride away to the studios where you can make a film and then go to the West End. So that, that's something that, I, that I, I'm always jealous of, and you have many 
many, many hundreds of years of, of experiences that we don't. And because when Broadway was the pinnacle of the art of the theater in this country, the fact that it was commercial was kind of ignored. Nobody really cared. And, you know, they had your friends and, you know, we'd raise a bunch of money and do a show on Broadway. I actually, when I was 24 years old, was part of a production that played for a week out of, uh, out of time in Boston. It was so two weeks out of town, Boston was supposed to come in. One set, eight character comedy, that the budget was $200,000. <laughs> that's long gone. I, but, you know, that's, even then, that was more of a, of a sort of fun group thing to do. Now at the prices, it's not that. But the other thing is just the, the, your point about the, the public theater. When the public theater had that many, there wasn't Lincoln Center Theater, there wasn't the Manhattan Theater Club, there wasn't the Roundabout. There are institutions in New York, in addition to the regional theaters that, that have always, or at least since they established, been a feeder to Broadway in a certain way. But th those, those three have filled a kind of gap that I think used to be um, not necessary or the public was part of that. So that there, there is more of a, yes, institutional theaters are places where you can fail that expression, and there are more of them in New York than there ever were today. I think that's, that's helpful for the for mm. cause. And where do you stand on, on the business of, of exceptions and rules? Well, <coughs> I'm a writer, and um, I suspect that my mindset is not very different from anybody else's. When you are writing, when you're embarking on a project, and you think, what you know, what is it about this that's going to speak to people? What is it's going to? What is it that's going to take them by surprise? What's? What is it about this story that's going to be compelling? What am I going to do? It to to attract to make them want to listen to it. Um, those are the things that you, you you deal with. And how is this thing that I have to that I feel compelled to say or, or to write about? How is that going to grab people. The nice thing for me about about musicals is that it's a popular art form. That is to mm. say, um, if it doesn't speak to the audience, if it doesn't move you right there in the theater, it's not successful. It doesn't matter. Unlike operas, which have become uh, you know, things that speak to the intelligentsia, and you can be bored in the theater, and uh, everyone will tell you what a great work it is, but we know that theatrically <laughs> yeah. it is just simply boring. And most modern operas are just plain terrible dramatically. They're yes, just yes. And they're terrible dramatically. They just they're yes, you know, regardless they're of the music. Actually, they the pay music no or the you the know theater. it's all kind of very art esoteric and wonderful, but you know <laughs> you're bored. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the musical theater doesn't tolerate that. If you don't grab them, touch them, move them, you're not going to be a success. Um, financially, the financially kind of follows from that. If you've written something that's exciting and different and takes people by surprise, the chances are it'll be successful. And, and, um, and the nice thing for writers is that uh, Broadway is not the end of the world. Um, I mean, I, I have a very nice career based upon shows that weren't terribly successful the first time around, but 20, 30 years later, they're produced all over the place. That's very nice. You know, it's really, yeah. I, I think of them as, you know, elves. You wake up in the morning and there's a pair of shoes on the, <laughs> on the foot of the bed. Uh, uh, and, and it's really, it, 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 it's, it, it's great. You, 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 they, these things go out into the world. We were talking about cast albums. Cast albums are basically your calling card. People hear the score. People miles away from you hear the score and decide that they love it and they want to produce it, and they, and you know, and it gets done. That's pretty healthy. I mean, for me, it is at any rate. Um, so my feeling is that ever, that there are out there, there are a bunch of people who are attempting to speak in some kind of unique way, something that they have to say, something that's their own voice, and if they f are lucky enough to find it, they, um, they compel you. Picking up on that, would it be fair to say, therefore, that perhaps Broadway has, be if Broadway's become an irrelevance, should we perhaps be looking at Regional theatres, uh, you know, the state of the the state of theatre across America is pr is allowing. You will know this better than I. 
allowing writers to find their voice, to have their voice. Um, well, I certainly understand that Chicago is, is a place where, as an actor, you can make a proper living. You can, there's, there's a lot of theatre happening in Chicago, a lot of very diverse work. Is, is that...? Yes, I mean, I think Chicago is, <coughs> uh, Chicago is the other great theatre town in, in, uh, in the United States, I think. And given the opportunity to spend a season watching plays in Chicago or a season watching plays in New York, Frankly, I'd be hard put to choose one over the other. Um, the problem with regional theater, from a writer's point of view, I think, and I think many writers have thrived in the regional theater, is that it's in a region. You know, so you, if you want to see the work, you have to go there. So if you are a successful playwright in Seattle, that's you know mm -hmm. that's a good experience for you in Seattle with an audience that lives in Seattle. Yeah. Um, and there, for, for better or worse, and fair or unfair, we we in America don't see that as the same thing as being a successful writer in New York on Broadway. I'm, going, um, I'm just taking the show to Seattle. Yeah, I, I, I love Seattle. Seattle's I'm another going city. to Seattle. Seattle's another city that I wouldn't mind sitting through a season of theater in. Um, you know, Wichita, I'm not so sure about, but <laughs> you know, there are, there are ver there's very good theater being produced in these places. It's more of a, a sort of a prestige perception that, well, but you're not in New York, you know? Yeah. Uh, we are not at the end of the session, but we are, I think it's enough from us. Uh, God questions, knows. questions from you, gentlemen, here. There's a uh, mic. Are there mics? There, uh, there's a mic coming down here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad the way this turned out, because it started out being the future of theater being equivalent to the future of Broadway. And what I think you finally segue to is actually there's an immense amount of wonderful theater happening that's not on Broadway. In New York, you just skimmed the surface when you said Manhattan Theater Club and Roundabout. I mean, there's Signature and Playwrights Horizon and Atlantic and... Second stage. There's so many things going on. I mean, you can go crazy if you want to subscribe to all these things. So I use those only because wearing my Tony Award hat, they're Tony eligible. <laughs> oh, okay. So all I want, uh, the point I really want to make is I think that I would argue, and maybe we've already argued it, that the future of the theater is really proving to be not Broadway, really, but uh, what's going on everywhere else. That's a comment that got thrown in. But. I mean, the, the uh, uh, regional theater, which I was involved in in Philadelphia, it, it has been a terrible business. Uh, and trying to get support for nonprofit theater has been very difficult in the last, since 2008 in particular. Uh, and yet, most of the great Broadway productions are, uh, get started elsewhere. Most of Sondheim ends up, starts out in either La Jolla or Chicago or someplace else. Most, So how do we revitalize and get audiences into those, into the regional theaters? Because they're very small audiences, very small regional theater, and yet most of the, as you say, most of the stuff that's coming to Broadway, except for the Disney-type productions, comes out of out of the regional theaters. and. And I don't think it's just so much people in the regions because people do travel to Boston or to, to Philadelphia or uh, in, in LA down to Orange County and, 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 uh, and to San Diego to see things. Well, I think individual people travel, but it's not like there's a whole population of theater goers, um, national theater goers in any one of those cities where there is a sort of a population of national theater goers in New York. Um, I, I'm, I, I think that the, that the state of the regional theaters, Robert Brewstein always tried to use the phrase resident theater rather than regional theater because there was something demeaning about the word regional. And I, I actually agree with him, but, it's, but I don't seem to have won that argument, neither does he, so the hell with it. Um, you know, I, I was just in Washington at Arena Stage working on a new show that's gonna then move to second stage and then perhaps eventually into a commercial production. You can't get a ticket for love nor money. Um, to some degree, I think it's about which city how well funded that theater is, how well marketed it is, how exciting the work they're doing on a consistent basis is. Um, and all of those theaters are, are, are risky business. They're not really businesses. They, well, they are not-for-profit businesses. But um, some of them are consistently very successful. Some of them really struggle. And some are in between. And some go up and down. And they're successful for a while. I, I, I think without, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dancing as fast as I can here, because I think without actually being at that theater and in that place, it's very hard for me to have a perception of how it could be made better. But you know, the big 
difference between what you were describing at the National Theater or the Royal Court and us is that we are basically a, a country of pure capitalists by and large, and we don't really believe that the arts should be supported by our government at a really serious level. If we did, we'd be supporting them, and we're not. Um, so the reason I left The Lion King out of my previous argument is that a company like Disney, that is a multi-billion dollar company, can do the kind of developmental work that the National Theater can do, for better or worse. I mean, you may or may not like what they end up with. Um, whereas a typical Broadway producer who's struggling to find investors to get to his $15 million cannot. Um, and the resident theaters, regional theaters, have the similar problem of not being supported at a state and federal level at a high enough level to develop their audiences, to develop new works, to, 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 to really have everything on, fully on the burner. You know, They're sort of like a garden that's not getting enough sun. And I think the sun is money. I would also point out that because of the age, as Jack pointed out, of these theaters, um, the people who, who originated them, certainly artistically, are no longer there. So they're all in some stage of transition. And um, that, because I, I do believe that art, they are artistically focused and everything, you know, something, often there's a very good pair between a business manager and an artistic person. But that's, that's one of the things I think when they, they, if they don't have a clear new vision from somebody, some, from the, 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 the successor, then they can sometimes get a little bit lost for a period of time. They also tend to imitate Broadway in ways that they probably shouldn't. The marketing meeting coming right after the announcement of the title is not unfortunately limited to uh, <laughs> the commercial theater. I wish it was. Uh, I have a slightly retro question. When I grew up in Ireland, there was a sauce in the theater. It was farmhouse, kitchen sink drama with added alcohol and Sean O'Casey. Looking to London, it was Shakespeare, restoration, and drawing room. Was there ever a Broadway sauce? And if so, where is it now? Broadway, I, I did. Was, there was there a definable source and ethos of Broadway that was as clearly definable as, say, Shakespeare restoration and drawing room in England and Irish farmhouse kitchen sink? I kind of doubt it. Uh, only, uh, I mean, the way I would answer it is, is the, the notion that I sort of said before that I don't think everybody, it wasn't perceived as commercial, although it was. It's just for all of America, that was the top of the American theater. Everything on Broadway was there. Musicals, plays, whatever. And when you, it's interesting when you look at the best plays of the 30s and the 40s, I mean, they were crappy plays. <laughs> things you'd never heard of that landed, you know, that opened a week. But they were, you know, unlike today, the, the you know, 15 years of just getting started for The Lion King. It, it was just constantly moving. And I think my sense is that it, 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 the, pr the change to it being something which is more the marketplace, the cream rises to the top, and therefore it goes to Broadway and finds the international audience. That's made these conversations have to go out and wider and think, wait a minute, is that, the, is that artistically ir ir irrelevant, or is, is it something else that's actually a very successful business now, and we have to acknowledge that, but then where has it kind of gone to? Where, where has the restoration comedy and the, you know, it, it's kind of spread out, and I'm not sure that it's any, it, any one definable place. I think the answer is that actually, and this is a massive generalization, so forgive me, but much as I, I admire the plays of Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, Edward Albee as much as the next person, but generally speaking, the tradition of Broadway and London, have, the different traditions have been, if you say, I'm going to the theater in London, you mean a play, and if you say I'm going to the theater on Broadway, you mean a musical, and that actually, that's where your source lies. It's, it's because it's a supremely American invention, the, the musical comedy into the musical play. Better answer. <laughs> uh, I'd like to address myself to the quality of writing. Mr. Balsby spoke about the fact, and I agree with him, that there are a lot of young people who are writing very interesting and serious plays. However, when one goes to the theater now, often it's a, about an incident rather than about a really development of, 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 a, of a plot, a development of characters, what we used to call in the old-fashioned world rising action. And uh, that is coupled with the fact that uh, the attention span is such that uh, if, if it's more than 90 minutes, people, a lot of people get <laughs> restive. And I'm just wondering 
how you feel that we can return. It used to be in the old days. You go to New York, you could see in one, you could see the Jacob store, you could see a Tennessee Williams, you could see uh, Arthur Miller and so forth. As you say, you're hard put to find that quality of writing in a straight play now. And how, how do you f all feel about that? Well, young writers tend to, uh, today uh, we, we tend to honor uh, the writer's voice, first of all. Do they have a unique voice? And that does not often, uh, uh, is not often accompanied by a sense of structure and a sense of, of traditional um, uh, playwriting values. What tends to happen is that these writers with their young, with their unique voices write some very interesting things, but as they get to their fourth and fifth plays, they start discovering, Lanford Wilson discovered uh, the, the well-made play after about 20 years. <laughs> and he went, oh my God, isn't that amazing? Um, uh, and, and, and started writing very different things. I, I mean, I, I saw a play uh, just the other day called Significant Other in New York, written by a young playwright named Joshua Harmon who had written a play called Bad Jews. Bad Jews was a, was a voice, a, <laughs> just a voice from beginning to end. It was terrific. It was not really a satisfying play, but it was a voice. This play was a structured play, and it really had a satisfying ending, and it was, it was structured, it was much simpler, and it, was still, it still emphasized the bravura voice of this unique writer. It's spectacular writing, and... Uh, um, Significant other closes this weekend, so you're probably going to miss it. But, um, got another it, uh, absolutely 18 hours to get to it. it it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, I, I, and that's just one example. I mean, you you, you find it all all the time. Uh, 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 writers who have have uh, uh, e extraordinary voices and and uh, the battle is always structure. Anytime you're writing anything, uh, you you you. Uh, as you get to your last weeks of previews, the question you're always asking is, what is the show about? <laughs> and uh, you know, how is the show organized? All of us, uh, all of us are doing that. Uh, I, I, I was once uh, um, uh, moderating something at, at, at the BMI workshop, and some young writer had presented something, and I was talking about how it didn't hold together as a, as a play, and, and, and I said, it's just playwriting 101. And then it occurred to me to say, and by the way, there is no Playwriting 102. <laughs> right. you, ju <laughs> you just keep learning Playwriting 101 on every show over and over again. You ask yourself what the rules are and how you're going to, you know, how, how it's going to come to a satisfying conclusion. And you teach yourself over and over again. And anything you learned on your last play, you can't apply to the next one. And if you try, you'll fail. And you have to invent the process all over again. That's the thrilling and utterly terrifying thing about writing. Did you? I, yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out one um, business reality that I think is contributing to what you're talking about, which is that when you find a writer with a voice who has not yet developed a real structural sense, structural sense is more of like a graduate course. I mean, you actually can learn it in a sense, a voice you have to have. Those writers with a voice, they have a reasonably dazzling debut of something that isn't really satisfying, but you go, wow, there's a young writer. Huh? And then they have a second play, and then you look around, and they're writing for the golden, second golden age of television. <laughs> they are out That's there, true. or in New York, or wherever they are, writing for Masters of Sex, or uh, you know, Breaking Bad, or something, and we never hear from them again. And you know, they want success as much as any of us want success, and they're being offered a level of security and excitement that sitting in a garret and writing your fourth and fifth and sixth play does not really guarantee. And I think that's a real problem. It is true. Yeah. Well, I, it I gives you an income. Yes, It gives right. you an actual, you can support your family. And a income. pool. And, you know. We have time for one, one, uh, one more question. Yeah, I seem to have a microphone. Yeah. My, my first theater experience was in 1943 at Oklahoma. I took a girlfriend, I think it was $8 each. Uh, and I've been to the theater and uh, Broadway and everywhere, London, for years. One thing about the future, not mentioned yet, but I think it's part of it. It's already arrived. I used to go to the National Theater in London. I can now drive from Kent, where I live, down the mountain, up the mountain, uh, to Millerton in half an hour, New York State, small city, to the movie house, and I can see Helen Mirren in the audience uh, from the National. 
<laughs> you don't see her in the audience, actually. Yeah, well, you could be. see her in the audience. We have Meryl Streep lives yeah. within 10 minutes of the movie house, so we can do with her. <laughs> you can see Meryl Streep in the audience seen, watching. Uh, Kevin Spacey uh, in the making of Richard III. Anyway, National Theater. So uh, more, pe more and more people may be going to movie theaters to see those uh, plays and operas, and they are. What about it's, that? Uh, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna because we are running out of time. I'm going to I'm going to field that answer. I think it's I, I think it's a very I, I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, I love the fact that uh, the National Theatre's audience reach has suddenly gone worldwide. It actually started over here. Um, Nicholas Heitner, who's the director of the National Theatre and famously, most famously directed Miss Saigon, but is now the director of the National Theatre, did a production of Twelfth Night at Lincoln Centre at some point in the mid-late 90s. Uh, and it was filmed. Uh, as a live broadcast and done over here, and 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 Heitner realised that 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 needed finessing and developing, but there was potential in it, and developed it for National Theatre, and now lots of London theatres and lots of other theatres over here are beginning to film performances and show them. It's great; it increases audience reach. It's a hybrid, in my view. I saw that Helen Mirren Fedra um, live from the National in cinema, having seen it on stage. It gives you what theatre can never do, it gives you the best seats in the house. You get a close-up of Helen Mirren. You're not going, well, I know that Helen Mirren's there, but I'm seated <laughs> here and she's somewhere down there. Um, so you get, you get the immediacy, but what you don't get, which is what Ted was talking about earlier, is the one-on-one, -on -one. I am in the room. This is what is happening in front of me. The interesting thing to me that happened at the end of that fair that I saw in a cinema in South London was that everybody applauded in the movie house, everybody, put, because they felt they were sort of at a live event. So perhaps it's a hyphenate. Uh, yes, it could well be a hyphenate. Um, I would like to thank everybody for 8.30 in the morning getting here and my excellent panel. Thank you.